Uh, we're going to read the first 11 verses, but there's, I, I want to set this up for you just a little uh, bit this morning. This event, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, is so much talked about in the Old Testament that starting back in the book of, of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 12, we're not going to read there, but just stay in Matthew 21. In the book of Exodus in chapter 12, Jesus, or God, gave instructions to the Israelites about celebrating the Passover. And that's where we are. We're in Passover season. In Matthew 21, um, we're just a few days away from uh, Passover. And it's actually, in Matthew 21, it is actually the day that the lamb is selected the Passover lamb is selected on this particular Sunday, all right? This was the first day of the week. It was a Sunday. And uh, uh, traditionally what would happen is that based on the instructions of Exodus chapter 12, and I would encourage you to read it later, but uh, in, in Exodus chapter 12, the Israelites were instructed uh, to go out and to find from their flocks uh, if they didn't have flocks from the flocks of somebody nearby, that they were to go out and find the healthiest, the strongest, uh, the best-looking lamb that they could possibly find in the flock. They were to bring this lamb into their house. This lamb was to live with them for a period of time, almost as a pet. Now, you can see this, the, the sim symbolism that's involved here. Christ came, lived with us, walked among us as one of us, the lamb became one of the family, all right? And then on the appropriate day, on the day of Passover, this lamb was to be sacrificed. And the blood from this lamb, according to the instructions in Exodus chapter 12, the blood from this lamb was then to be painted along the doorpost of the house of the Jews, because what was going to happen was is that the death angel was going to come through Egypt. And the firstborn of every household that did not have the blood on the doorpost of its house, the firstborn would be killed. But when the death angel came through, and this is the cool part, I think, that when the death angel came through, all the death angel did was look for houses that had the blood on the doorpost. And this is the cool part. The, the death angel didn't look inside to see who was inside. That didn't matter. What mattered was, was their blood on the doorpost from that lamb that had been slain. And, and when the death angel saw that uh, blood, the death angel would pass over that house. And no one from that house, no one from the flocks of that house would be killed. But those who didn't have the blood on the doorpost of their homes suffered great loss, is that the firstborn of that home was killed. The firstborn of the flocks of that home was killed. And so we've got the whole story of Jesus wrapped up in the Passover lamb found in Exodus chapter 12. And we'll discover that some of the other prophets, and one in particular, Zechariah, prophesied that Jesus would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Actually, not so much even a donkey, we were talking about that, but it was the colt of a donkey. What a great picture that was, the colt. Jesus riding a colt that had never been ridden before, and the colt let Jesus ride him. And you stop and think about, well, why? How did he get away with that? How did that happen? Well, it's easy. The creator and the creation got together. The creation knew the creator. I got to tell you this. I, I, I know maybe I talk about it too much. When our granddaughter was born, early, she very quickly would wake up in the mornings, for the lack of a better term, singing. She would make noises. She was cooing. She was a happy little baby. She's still a happy little baby. It's fun to be around her. 
And I remembered thinking to myself, uh, think somebody's coming in or going out, I'm not sure. Okay, I, it's really windy out there. Uh, I can remember thinking to myself when they would tell me about what she was doing, I remember thinking, she's talking to angels. She's talking to God because she just, she left a little bit early. And she's still carrying on these conversations. And so when I hear about Jesus getting on the back of this colt, Normally would be very wild and would buck him off and would have a real problem situation. But when the creator sat on what was created, it worked exactly the way that it was supposed to be. And I think that's a really cool picture. So we've got this picture all over the Old Testament about the Messiah coming in. And then I will tell you this much. It takes me a long time to go into this, and so I'm not going to. But in the book of Daniel... It is prophesied about Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem on a colt. He prophesied the exact day it happened. And it's there. And so I'm just amazed at this event and the symbolism of this event and the message of this event for you and for me. It's such an important part of this story. And in just a few minutes, we're going to use those palm branches. So uh, don't get hungry and start chewing on them. Okay? All right? We'll, 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 we'll use them in just a minute. So Matthew chapter 21, we're going to read all of the first 11 verses. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that uh, are, are found there. Okay? So now, when they drew near uh, Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you, sh you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet in Zechariah 9, 9. Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 6, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and sat him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the ground and on the road, and others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Son of David was a title for the Messiah. So they're proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. It's interesting. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who was sent by the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All the blessings of heaven rest upon him. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved and saying, Who is this? And so the multitudes said, This is Jesus, the prophet, from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, the path that Jesus rode the donkey on was probably the same path that just either day, uh, uh, hours before or hours after that the high priest would have gone to the flocks of Bethlehem. Remember the shepherds from Bethlehem when Jesus was born? The angel appeared to them and began to talk, and, uh, and they sang. A group of angels then began to say, and they didn't sing, but they talked, okay? So the high priest would go annually before Passover, on this day before Passover, and select the lamb for the Passover lamb in the temple. And he would come back and, and, and would, would make a progression uh, on this path with the lamb draped over his neck. And there would be people who would be cheering because this lamb was going to be slaughtered, be, be killed. The blood from this lamb would be what symbolized the forgiveness of all these people on this Passover day. And it was a day to not only commemorate 
what God had done for the ancestors in Egypt to set them free, to bring them out of the bondage. 400 years of slavery that they were set free from. And so they would celebrate. Passover was, was, was a great time. Passover was one of the three uh, feasts that uh, all Jewish men were commanded to return to Jerusalem for. It's entirely possible, I've read accounts that have said that it's possible that there were two million additional people in the city of Jerusalem for Passover. Now, I will tell you this, my Jerusalem probably had a population of a couple hundred thousand, maybe, or a little bit less. Um, the state of Iowa has three million people, so two-thirds of the state of Iowa would have been in the city of Jerusalem for that day. And so it wouldn't have been hard to find a crowd. So let's talk about some of these things that happened. Um, first of all, four to five hundred years before this happened, the prophet Zechariah, and we read that in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. I don't know if you want to venture back into the Old Testament to see if you can find Zechariah or not. I should have uh, uh, found out what page it was on for you. I apologize for that. I know that that was a practice here uh, long before that. So it's on, actually, it's on page 1,998. Okay, if you have Pew Bible that you're reading, it's on page 1,000. 98. Okay? So in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, four to five hundred years before the birth of Christ, this prophet, Zechariah, prophesied and wrote to the people, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, to the Jews. Okay? Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and humble and lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so I think that that's interesting, that, that Zechariah. So the, the, the picture painted here by the prophet was of the Messiah coming to establish his kingdom. I've told you before on occasions that Messiah always represented peace, shalom. He always represented hope. He always represented uh, 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 freedom and deliverance from the enemies. The belief among the Jews, and still is today among Orthodox Jews, is that when Messiah comes... Life will be different. When Messiah comes, we will be free. When Messiah comes, there, that, that we will have peace, shalom. And, and peace uh, for the Jews, or shalom, if you hear somebody wish you shalom, actually what they're saying is more than just an absence of conflict. All right? They're, they're, saying, they're actually saying the fulfillment of what John 10.10 10 has to say is that, that Christ came in order for us to have a rich and a, please, uh, a, a fulfilling life. And so when they say shalom to you, it's more than just no hope you have no conflicts. It's, I hope your life is fulfilling. I hope your life is pleasing. I hope your life is good. I hope your life is full of joy and full of health and of all the best of things that can possibly be yours. May it be wrapped up in shalom for your life. And so that's the picture that Zechariah is painting. The second thing I want to talk about is the mystery of the donkey. I've always wondered about these things, and someone told me one time that I think too much about some of these things. But i got to admit to you that when I read about uh, Jesus sending two of the disciples, we don't know which two, all right? But, uh, and, and he said, will you go? And he said, when you get into town, there's going to be this donkey. And Matthew says, not only will there be a donkey, but there will be a colt of the donkey, and they'll be tied up there. Bring them to me, and if somebody says something to you, tell them that the Lord has need of them. Well, sure enough, somebody said something to them, and they said, the Lord needs them, and they didn't say anything. They said, go ahead, go ahead. And so I've always wondered about that. So was that supernatural? I don't know. Was it arranged beforehand? I don't know. Was it somebody that knew who Jesus was, and that whatever Jesus wanted, that was okay, and all the disciples had to do was to say, the Lord needs this. And I don't know how it worked out that way, but I just know that somehow in some way God worked it out so that, that when Jesus needed the colt of a donkey, there just happened to be somebody who knew Jesus who was willing to allow the colt of their donkey to be used by Jesus. 
Did he return it? I assume so. We don't have record of that in the scriptures. We don't know who the owners were. But we just know that somehow that whatever needed to happen to fulfill the prophecies of God, it happened. Okay? Now, I want to tell you this much, all right, that there are promises that you can say these were prophecies, these were promises that were made to me in the scriptures. Uh, there's over 2,500 promises, actually more than, than that, maybe 3,600 promises. And in a few weeks, we're going to talk about some of those promises again. But that every promise, Paul says in, in his letter to the Corinthians, that every promise that has your name attached to them is yea and amen. They're going to happen. It's going to come about somehow and some way. I don't know how. That's the cool part about God is that I don't always understand how God works. I just know he works. And I know that sometimes, many times, actually the older I get, most of the time he works in ways that I don't get. I didn't think about that happening that way. All right? I call it uh, being a flat forehead Christian. It's like, oh man, that's what God was doing. Have you ever had that experience? And I go, oh wow, why didn't I think of Why didn't I try to do it that way? Well, God works in ways that are different than you and I have. And it doesn't mean you're not smart. Okay? It just means He's smarter, He's God. And just as Creator, as the Creator sat on the creation and it worked well, that whatever it is that needs to happen in your life, happen in my life, that God is able to bring that about somehow in some way. And, and we just need to relax and let God do those things that, that um, he wants to do. So the third thing is, is that Matthew, and I've talked about this enough that I probably will pass over it, no pun intended, um, that, that Matthew tells us that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of this colt. Now, there's some symbolism involved here that I think is very important. Chris mentioned that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and offered himself not only as the Passover lamb, but he offered himself as the king. And the king didn't come riding in on this war horse or in a war chariot. The king came riding in on a donkey. The donkey symbolized peace. If you heard the king was coming to your house, one of the questions that you would ask if you were alive at this time, how's he coming? Is he in a chariot? Is he on a horse? Because if he was in a chariot, if he's on a horse, you were probably in trouble. But if the report came back, oh, he's riding a donkey. Oh, good. He's coming in shalom. He's coming in peace. He's coming with a good report and not for war. And there are all kinds of examples. There are some examples on, on, uh, uh, on the study, on the note sheet about in the Old Testament how that when kings came, they came either on a, a horse for war or they came on a donkey. Now, I will tell you this much, and we don't, won't take the time to do this, but I can show you a picture in Revelation, the end, when Jesus comes back the second time. He literally comes back to the earth. He's riding a stallion. He is riding a war horse like has never been ridden before because he's coming back for a war like has never been fought before. It will be the war to end all wars. The whole world will be lined up. But the cool part is there's only one punch to this war. God throws that one punch and all of evil is destroyed. And it's a great picture for us to keep in mind as we go through this Easter season. So God sent Jesus on the back of a colt. The fourth thing is that in verse 7 of Matthew 21, we learn that the folks laid their clothes and either on the donkey or on the road as Jesus was going before them. This was pretty typical of in the Old Testament. You see examples of that in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. There are examples of that, of when, when, when the king would enter into town on a donkey, that they would take their robes, their cloaks, and throw them out. There's one place where, where one, uh, one of the soldiers is declared to be the king. 
the prophet comes and tells this uh, soldier that God has chosen you to be the next king. And his friends who are there in the group say, well, what did that crazy man have to say? And he says, oh, he just said something about me being the next king. And what was cool was is that they just immediately took their cloaks off and laid them on the floor in front of this guy. So that the feet of the king never touched the ground, but the feet of the king walked in the comfort of their cloaks. And so when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, riding on this colt, the people of the Jerusalem knew what was happening. They were familiar enough with the Old Testament. They knew the prophecies. They knew the prophecy of Zechariah. They knew the patterns of, of the uh, Passover. They knew all of these things about the Messiah being promised and coming on a peaceable animal. And they knew that this was their new king. And they knew that the custom was for the king to walk on their cloaks. And so they threw them down on the ground. Chris mentioned uh, very quickly in, in her time this morning how that just a few days later, these people who were proclaiming Jesus to be the king, crying out to him as their Messiah and, and waving the palm branches, which we'll get to next, is that, that just a few days later, these people turned on him. And instead of proclaiming him the king, they were crying out for his crucifixion. The fifth thing is, is that many of the people cut the palm branches to wave. The scripture tells us that some threw their cloaks while others cut palm branches to raise. A palm branch, a palm branch easy for you to say, a palm branch was such a, an important symbol to the Jews. It was very much like the symbolism of our own flag, the red, white, and blue. Reminds us of, of, of the, the price that was paid for our freedom and symbolizes the land of the free and the home of the brave. And it was very important to them. A palm branch was on the back of the, the last coins that the Jews ever minted for themselves. It was, it was their statement of, their declaration of independence was this, this palm branch. And so here they are cutting these palm branches. And, and, and in just a moment, the sixth thing is that they started shouting out, and we, we, we read this in, in uh, the, the text in Matthew, is that they're shouting out uh, while they're waving the branches, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Son of David was a name for the Messiah. I mentioned that. And so they started calling out Hosanna. This was a quote from, uh, ex, uh, from Psalm chapter 118. Let me tell you about Psalm 118. I'll do this very quickly. Psalm 118 was the final psalm of a group of psalms called the Hillel Psalms. And the Hillel Psalms were psalms that were sung during Passover. Some were sung before the meal was eaten. Some were sung after the meal of, was eaten. Matter of fact, if you read the account of Jesus with the disciples in the upper room where the Last Supper was instituted, it says that when supper was done and they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Probably the song that they sang that night was from Psalm 118, the last of the Hillel Psalms. And in this psalm is this cry for freedom. There's this cry from uh, deliverance of their sin. See, everything is symbolic with this, all right? It literally happened, but there's symbolism involved. You see, the whole element of Passover is the celebration of the deliverance that God brought to the Jews from 400 years of slavery. Jesus is coming to bring deliverance over a lifetime of sin. He's coming to set us free from the bondage of sin. Now, I've had people argue with me uh, in years past, never here, uh, you're too smart for that, uh, not to argue with me, but you know better than you know the truth, all right? The truth is that, that when we were in sin, we were in bondage. And I could probably spend time with each one this morning and talking about, especially as an adult, and talking about your life prior to Christ. What held you in bondage? 
Was it your temper? Was it alcohol? Was it money? Was it this? Was it that? What held you in bondage? What drove you to do the things that you did? And many of us would be able to point to things of the sinful nature. My anger did it. I heard someone talking yesterday, a professional golfer, and, and someone that I've watched probably most of my life, and he was talking about, about his, he had a nickname called Gentle Ben, and somebody said, you are not gentle, how did you get that name? And he says, no, you're right, I have a violent temper. And I saw it a number of times when he was playing golf. And he says, but I had to learn how to my temper would not control me. I know lots of people who are controlled by their temper. And they're paying bills from their temper. And, and it's just been like they were in bondage to their temper. But what Jesus said is that I've come to set you free. I've come to be your deliverer. And no longer do you have to be in bondage to this sinful thing or to that sinful thing. But now you are free to live in peace to live for me in a way that honors me. Now, there's something that we need to understand here. And I was going to do this and have you look at it, but I, I, I changed my mind. There were two people mentioned in the book of Acts. One named Theudas and the other named Judas. Judas, about the time Jesus was born, led a rebellion against the Romans. Tradition says that Judas and his, not the Judas that betrayed Jesus, a different one, that Judas led his followers along this very same path that Jesus was riding the donkey on because he was going to lead a rebellion that would set the Jews free from the Romans. <laughs> he didn't make it to Jerusalem. They got him. And a man telling the story about Judas, and then he said, and then there was this guy named Theodos. You can read this in the book of Acts. Then there was this guy named Theodos that, that, that he decided he was going to lead a rebellion. And I don't know if he came down this same path that Jesus walked on. Probably so. It was the traditional path that if you were going to be the redeemer of Israel, the deliverer of Israel, this was the path that you came down because it was what the Passover lamb, it was what the Messiah was going to do. And if you presented yourself as a Messiah for Jerusalem, you came down this path. He didn't make it either. But the fascinating thing is, is that Jesus gets on the back of this donkey. The cloaks are thrown down. The donkey doesn't try to buck him off. And the people cut palm branches and they begin to wave them. That in and of itself was considered an act of rebellion. Matter of fact, others in the Gospels will record how that some of the leaders of the Jews came and said to Jesus, you've got to stop these people. Stop them from waving the branches. Stop them from crying Hosanna because those are fighting words to the Romans. Those are threatening actions to the Romans because they think you're going to be like Judas or they think you're going to be like Theudas and that you're going to try to overthrow the Roman government and establish the Jewish government. So Jesus says, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. I came to rule, I came to bring my kingdom and to rule from the inside out, not from the outside in. So here's what I want you to do with those palm branches. And I don't have one, which that's okay. I just, I'm sorry. What would I do without you? I have no idea. I'd be a really big mess. Uh, I don't know how long these would last. You know, if you've ever gone to a church where um, you've gone forward on Ash Wednesday and they put the ashes on your forehead, traditionally, those ashes came from the palm fronds, these, from the year before. They kept them, dried them, and eventually burned them and used the ashes for Ash Wednesday the next year. 
But you can, might want to hang on. Never mind, I can't bend over and get that. I'm sorry. <laughs> if I bend over, I'll probably finish the rest of the sermon from down there. It'd be a lot more comfortable. All right. But maybe you need to do something symbolically with this. Maybe there's something in your life that's a little bit controlling. She's not asleep, Charlie. Leave her alone. <laughs> maybe there's something in your life that's a lot controlling. Maybe you have anger issues. Maybe it's a substance. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's a disease. But I can tell you today that when Jesus walked, rode on that donkey into Jerusalem, down that path, offered himself as the Passover lamb, offered his life, offered his blood so that you could be free. I just want you to know that there is hope for whatever it is that's going on in your life. And it's not Romans, it's not the person next to you or anything like that, but here's what I want you to do, just symbolically, and I want us to do it today. We'll do a, a practice run or two here, okay? But I want you just to pick this thing up and begin to wave this, because that was the declaration that I don't have to live like this anymore. And I want you to cry out, Hosanna. Say that, Hosanna. 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 Hosanna, Lord, save us now. Set us free from the things that have held us in bondage for all these years. I no longer have to live this way. I can be free. Whether it's a disease, whether it's finances, whether it's offenses, whether it's fear, whatever it might be, is that I can be free because Jesus said so. The king has come. The blood has been applied. The angel is passing over and setting us free from the bondage that we've endured for so very, very long. I love that. So maybe you just need to keep one of these in your wallet to keep one around or someplace and just wave it around. Wives, maybe sometime you want to walk up to your husband and say, Hosanna! No, no, don't do that. Okay? Don't do that. If you do that, do it from a distance. Okay? All right? Do it in duck. All right? All right. So... All right, so I, I want you to know that there have been freedom declared. The Hosanna and the waving of the palm fronds was a war cry. And I think that as Christians, we need a war cry. Is that, God, we need you to set us free. We need you to deliver us. We need you to help us to rise up and to overcome the things that have tried to control us. And the, the cool part is, is that God will be faithful and that he will set us free. He will deliver us and he will be our king. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the victory that is ours. You won a great victory. You proclaimed victory on this day of the beginning of the end. You proclaimed victory over sin. You proclaimed victory over things that would try to control us. You proclaimed that victory for us. That you were greater than anything that would try to control us. And just as you set people free from the land of Egypt, you set us free today from the things that would try to hold us in bondage. And so I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you that we have a Messiah who has come and that we can proclaim Hosanna and that God will set us free and, and we can stay free from the bondages of sin. I thank you, God, for each one that is listening this morning online and those that are here in the room with us. May we take the truth of this day, the beginning of the end, the offer of a new king, the offer, offer of deliverance from our past, of deliverance from the things that would try to control us now. The offer of a blessed hope. The offer of a life that is abundant, that is rich, and that is satisfying. And not full of bondage. And so I thank you for that now, and I give you praise for that now. In the name of Jesus, amen.